Welcome to this special edition of Power and Politics. I'm Rosemary Barton. The wait is over. The first U.S. presidential debate is about to begin. With polls too close to call, could this be a turning point? Will Clinton or Trump be able to sway some of the 10 percent or so Americans who are, may still be undecided? We're going to bring you live to Hofstra University in Hampstead, New York. Uh, in just a moment, Lester Holt, the moderator, has taken his place. But here's our supercharged power panel that will give you full analysis after the debate uh, at around 1030. In Washington tonight, Politico's Louisa Savage. In Toronto, Amanda Alvaro from Pomp and Circumstance. Here in studio, Tim Powers from Summa Strategies, Media Styles' Ian Capstick, and CBC's poll analyst Eric Grenier. In about 15 seconds or less, each one of you. <laughs> That'll be easy. What are you expecting? Eric, you go first. Uh, well, Trump has been making some gains in the polls, so Hillary Clinton will need to do something to stop that momentum. Uh, the best thing they, that she can do there is to expose his greatest weakness in the polls, which is that a lot of Americans don't think he has the right temperament to be the president. Amanda. Well, this is all about performance versus policy. Can she back him into a corner so that he can't use his broad, sweeping generalizations? And can he put a highlight on the thing that people are most concerned about, her character and her integrity? Ian? From my perspective, I'm going to be looking at how serious is this Donald Trump presidency for Canada? Is he going to come after us on any economic fronts? Or are we going to see the sort of wild accusations that are easy to discount again until the next election cycle? Or will Canadian politicians be forced to contend with a Trump that is uh, leading a Clinton uh, by a larger margin than he might be already? Louisa? Can Trump pass the commander-in-chief test as someone you would trust with the nuclear codes? And can he appeal to white upper-income Republicans in the suburbs and the swing states? And can Clinton pass the trust test? And can she appeal to millennials who so far are going with the third-party candidates and aren't being won over to her candidacy just yet? All right, Powers, last one to you. On another channel, they're playing for a wild card spot in baseball. This is a wild card. Do we get a Trump <laughs> Lazio moment where he behaves like a chimpanzee and tries to intimidate Hillary Clinton? Or do we get a wow, we're kind of surprised moment? I think it's more about Trump than it is about Clinton today. Okay. We're, we're waiting for let that. I'm glad we all got our say in. That I, this means I can cut anybody off now and I'll feel okay about it. Uh <laughs> So we're waiting for uh, the heads up from Lester Holt, who is the moderator, the, the host of NBC Nightly News, uh, who has given us just now the one minute warning. I'll just let you know that he did come out in front of the audience before it began and did tell everybody not to react and not to clap. It's not that kind of debate. This is not a partisan offering. Uh, Bill Clinton arrived and shook hands with uh, Melania Trump and the Trump children. There are lots of people in the audience that are partisan, Rudy Giuliani and others who are all there watching. Uh, what is going to be a critical debate tonight. The polls, again, are relatively neck and neck at this stage. And uh, there is a lot riding on Donald Trump, who is untested in this format, and Hillary Clinton, who has been tested many times before in the debate. Let's, uh, let's bring you to the floor of the debate and see what we can listen to now. Quite silent. <laughs> Eric, give us uh, one thought about what you think might be the determining factor here. Well, most Americans uh, in polls say that they expect... Good evening from Hofstra I'll University. Thank you. We'll let Lester Hamstead, Holt take York. over. We're going to stand Lester by for analysis at the end of this of debate. NBC Nightly News. Enjoy. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. The participants tonight are Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. This debate is sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. The commission drafted tonight's format, and the rules have been agreed to by the campaigns. The 90-minute debate is divided into six segments, each 50 minutes long. We'll explore three topic areas tonight, achieving prosperity, America's direction, and securing America. At the start of each segment, I will ask the same lead-off question to both candidates, and they will each have up to two minutes to respond. From that point until the end of the segment, we'll have an open discussion. The questions are mine and have not been shared with the commission or the campaigns. The audience here in the room has agreed to remain silent so that we can focus on what the candidates are saying. I will invite you to applaud, however, at this moment as we welcome the candidates. Democratic nominee for President of the United States, Hillary Clinton, and Republican nominee for President of the United States, Donald J. Trump.
Well, I don't expect us to cover all the issues of this campaign tonight, but I remind everyone there are two more presidential debates scheduled. We are going to focus on many of the issues that voters tell us are most important, and we're going to press for specifics. I am honored to have this role, but this evening belongs to the candidates and just as important to the American people. Candidates, we look forward to hearing you articulate your policies and your positions, as well as your visions and your values. So, let's begin. We're calling this opening segment Achieving Prosperity, and central to that is jobs. There are two economic realities in America today. There's been a record six straight years of job growth, and new census numbers show incomes have increased at a record rate after years of stagnation. However, income inequality remains significant, and nearly half of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Beginning with you, Secretary uh, Clinton, why are you a better choice than your opponent to create the kinds of jobs that will put more money into the pockets of American workers? Well, thank you, Lester, and thanks to Hofstra for hosting us. The central question in this election is really what kind of country we want to be and what kind of future we'll build together. Today is my granddaughter's second birthday, so I think about this a lot. First, we have to build an economy that works for everyone, not just those at the top. That means we need new jobs, good jobs, with rising incomes. I want us to invest in you. I want us to invest in your future. That means jobs in infrastructure, in advanced manufacturing, in innovation and technology, clean renewable energy, and small business, because most of the new jobs will come from small business. We also have to make the economy fairer. That starts with raising the national minimum wage and also guarantee, finally, equal pay for women's work. I also want to see more companies do profit sharing. If you help create the profits, you should be able to share in them, not just the executives at the top. And I want us to do more to support people who are struggling to balance family and work. I've heard from so many of you about the difficult choices you face and the stresses that you're under. So let's have paid family leave, earn sick days. Let's be sure we have affordable childcare and debt-free college. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna do it by having the wealthy pay their fair share and close the corporate loopholes. Finally, we tonight are on the stage together, Donald Trump and I. Uh, Donald, it's good to be with you. We're going to have a debate where we are talking about the important issues facing our country. You have to judge us. Who can shoulder the immense, awesome responsibilities of the presidency? Who can put into action the plans that will make your life better? I hope that I will be able to earn your vote on November 8th. Secretary Clinton, thank you. Mr. Trump, the same question to you. It's about putting money, more money, into the pockets of American workers. You have up to two minutes. Thank you, Lester. Uh, our jobs are fleeing the country. They're going to Mexico. They're going to many other countries. You look at what China is doing to our country in terms of making our product. They're devaluing their currency, and there's nobody in our government to fight them. And we have a very good fight, and we have a winning fight, because they're using our country as a piggy bank to rebuild China, and many other countries are doing the same thing. So we're losing our good jobs, so many of them. When you look at what's happening in Mexico, a friend of mine who builds plants said it's the eighth wonder of the world. They're building some of the biggest plants anywhere in the world, some of the most sophisticated, some of the best plants. With the United States, as he said, not so much. So Ford is leaving. You see that, their small car division leaving thousands of jobs, leaving Michigan, leaving Ohio. They're all leaving, and we can't allow it to happen anymore. As far as child care is concerned and so many other things, I think Hillary and I agree on that. Uh, we probably disagree a little bit as to uh, numbers and amounts and what we're going to do, but perhaps we'll be talking about that later. But we have to stop our jobs from being stolen from us. We have to stop our companies from leaving the United States, and with it, firing all of their people. All you have to do is take a look at carrier air conditioning. In uh, Indianapolis, they left, fired 1,400 people. They're going to Mexico. So many, hundreds and hundreds of companies are doing this. We cannot let it happen. Under my plan, I'll be reducing taxes tremendously 
from 35% to 15% for companies, small and big businesses. That's going to be a job creator like we haven't seen since Ronald Reagan. It's going to be a beautiful thing to watch. Companies will come, they will build, they will expand, new companies will start. And I look very, very much forward to doing it. We have to renegotiate our trade deals and we have to stop these countries from stealing our companies and our jobs. Secretary Clinton, would you like to respond? Well, I think that trade is an important issue. Of course, we are 5% of the world's population. We have to trade with the other 95%. And we need to have smart, fair trade deals. We also, though, need to have a tax system that rewards work and not just financial transactions. And the kind of plan that Donald has put forth would be trickle-down economics all over again. In fact, it would be the most extreme version, the biggest tax cuts for uh, the top percent of the people in this country than we've ever had. I call it trumped up trickle down because that's exactly what it would be. That is not how we grow the economy. We just have a different view about what's best for growing the economy, how we make investments that will actually produce jobs and rising incomes. I think we come at it from somewhat different perspectives. Uh, I understand that. You know, Donald uh, was very fortunate in his life, and that's all to his benefit. Uh, he started his business with $14 million borrowed from his father. And he really believes that the more you help wealthy people, the better off we'll be, and that everything will work out from there. I don't buy that. I have a different experience. My father was a small businessman. He worked really hard. He printed drapery fabrics on long tables where he pulled out those fabrics and he went down with a silk screen and dumped the paint in and took the squeegee and kept going. And so what I believe is the more we can do for the middle class, the more we can invest in you, your education, your skills, your future, the better we will be off and the better we'll grow. That's the kind of economy I want us to see again. Let me follow up with Mr. Trump if I can. You've talked about creating 25 million jobs and you've promised to bring, bring back millions of, uh, of jobs for Americans. How are we going to bring back the industries that have left this country for cheaper labor overseas? How specifically are you going to tell American manufacturers that you have to come back? Well, for one thing, uh, and before we start on that, my father uh, gave me a very small loan in 1975, and I built it into a company that's worth many, many billions of dollars with some of the greatest assets in the world. And I say that only because that's the kind of thinking that our country needs. Our country's in deep trouble. We don't know what we're doing when it comes to devaluations and all of these countries all over the world, especially China. They're the, the best, the best ever at it. What they're doing to us is a very, very sad thing. So we have to do that. We have to renegotiate our trade deals. And Lester, they're taking our jobs, they're giving incentives, they're doing things that, frankly, we don't do. Uh, let me give you the example of Mexico. They have a VAT tax. We're in a different system. When we sell into Mexico, there's a tax when they sell in automatic, 16% approximately. When they sell into us, there's no tax. It's a defective agreement. It's been defective for a long time, many years, but the politicians haven't done anything about it. Now, in all fairness to uh, Secretary Clinton, yes, is that okay? Good. I want you to be very happy. It's very important to me. But in all fairness to Secretary Clinton, when she started talking about this, it was really very recently. She's been doing this for 30 years. And why hasn't she made the agreements better? The NAFTA agreement is defective just because of the tax and many other reasons, but just because of the fact. Let me interrupt just a moment. But Secretary Clinton and others, politicians, should have been doing this for years, not right now because of the fact that we've created a movement. They should have been doing this for years. What's happened to our jobs and our country and our economy generally is, look, we owe $20 trillion. We cannot do it any longer, Lester. Back to the question, though, how do you bring back, specifically bring back jobs, American manufacturers, how do you make them bring the jobs back? Well, the first thing you do is don't let the jobs leave. The companies are leaving. I could name, I mean, there are thousands of them. They're leaving, and they're leaving in bigger numbers than ever. And what you do is you say, fine, you want to go to Mexico or some other country, good luck. We wish you a lot of luck. But if you think you're going to make your air conditioners or your cars or your cookies or whatever you make, 
and bring them into our country without a tax, you're wrong. And once you say you're going to have to tax them coming in, and our politicians never do this, because they have special interests, and the special interests want those companies to leave, because in many cases, they own the companies. So what I'm saying is we can stop them from leaving. We have to stop them from leaving. And that's a big, big factor. Let me let Secretary Clinton well, get Well, let's stop for a second and remember where we were eight years ago. We had the worst financial crisis, the Great Recession, the worst since the 1930s. That was in large part because of tax policies that slashed taxes on the wealthy, failed to invest in the middle class, took their eyes off of Wall Street, and created a perfect storm. In fact, Donald was one of the people who rooted for the housing crisis. He said back in 2006, Gee, I, I hope it does collapse, because then I can go in and buy some and make some money. Well, it did collapse. That's called nine, business, by the nine way. Nine million people, <laughs> nine million people lost their jobs, five million people lost their homes, and $13 trillion in family wealth was wiped out. Now, we have come back from that abyss, and it has not been easy. So we're now on the precipice of having a potentially much better economy. But the last thing we need to do is to go back to the policies that failed us in the first place. Independent experts have looked at what I've proposed and looked at what Donald's proposed. And basically, they've said this, that if his tax plan, which would blow up the debt by over $5 trillion and would in some instances, disadvantage middle-class families compared to the wealthy were to go into effect, we would lose three and a half million jobs and maybe have another recession. They've looked at my plans and they've said, okay, if we can do this, and I intend to get it done, we will have 10 million more new jobs because we will be making investments where we can grow the economy. Take clean energy. Some country is going to be the clean energy superpower of the 21st century. Donald thinks that climate change is a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese. I think it's real. Uh, I, did I think not, science I did not, is real. I do not say that. And I think it's I do important not say that. that we grip this and deal with it, both at home and abroad. And here's what we can do. We can deploy a half a billion more solar panels. We can have enough clean energy to power every home. We can build a new modern electric grid. That's a lot of jobs. That's a lot of new economic activity. So I've tried to be very specific about what we can and should do, and I am determined that we're going to get the economy really moving again, building on the progress we've made over the last eight years, but never going back to what got us in trouble in the first place. Mr. Trump. She talks about solar panels. Uh, we invested in a solar company, our country. That was a disaster. They lost plenty of money on that one. Now, look. I'm a great believer in all forms of energy, but we're putting a lot of people out of work. Our energy policies are a disaster. Our country is losing so much in terms of energy, in terms of paying off our debt. You can't do what you're looking to do with 20 trillion in debt. The Obama administration, from the time they've come in, is over 230 years worth of debt, and he's topped it, he's doubled it, in a course of almost eight years, seven and a half years to be semi-exact. So I will tell you this, uh, we have to do a much better job at keeping our jobs. And we have to do a much better job at giving companies incentive to build new companies or to expand because they're not doing it. And all you have to do is look at Michigan and look at Ohio and look at all of these places where so many of their of their jobs and their companies are just leaving. They're gone. And Hillary, I just ask you this. You've been doing this for 30 years. Why are you just thinking about these solutions right now? For 30 years, you've been doing it, and now you're just starting to think of solutions. Well, actually, I will bring, excuse me, I will bring back jobs. You can't bring back jobs. Well, actually, um, I have thought about this quite a bit. Yeah, for 30 and years. I have, uh, well, not quite that long. Uh, I think my husband did a pretty good job in the 1990s. I think a lot about what worked and how we can make it work again. Well, he approved a million NAFTA. new jobs, he approved a NAFTA, balanced budget, which is the single and worst trade incomes, deal ever approved in this country. Incomes went up for everybody. Manufacturing jobs went up also in the 1990s. If we're actually going to look at the facts, when I was in the Senate, I had a number of trade deals that came before me. 
and I held them all to the same test. Will they create jobs in America? Will they raise incomes in America? And are they good for our national security? Some of them I voted for. The biggest one, a multinational one known as CAFTA, I voted against. And because I hold the same standards as I look at all of these trade deals. But let's not assume that trade is the only challenge we have in the economy. I think it is a part of it, and I've said what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a special prosecutor. We're going to enforce the trade deals we have, and we're going to hold people accountable. When I was Secretary of State, we actually increased American exports globally 30 percent. We increased them to China 50 percent. So I know how to really work to get new jobs and to get exports that help to create more new jobs. Very well, you haven't done it in 30 years or 26 years. Well, any number I, you I've want been to a do. senator. You Donald, haven't done it. And you haven't I done have it. been a and secretary of state, and I have. Your done husband signed a NAFTA, lot. which was one of the worst things that ever happened well, to the manufacturing your industry. That is your you opinion. go to New England, you go to Ohio, Pennsylvania, you go anywhere you want, Secretary Clinton, and you will see devastation where manufacturing is down 30, 40, sometimes 50 percent. NAFTA is the worst trade deal maybe ever signed any Anywhere, but certainly ever signed in this country. And now you want to approve Trans-Pacific Partnership. You were totally in favor of it. Then you heard what I was saying, how bad it is, and you said, I can't win that debate. But you know that if you did win, you would approve that, and that will be almost as bad as NAFTA. Nothing will ever well, top NAFTA. That That is just not accurate. I uh, was against it once it was finally negotiated and the terms were laid out. I wrote about that in... You called it the uh, gold standard. About, well, I hope... You called I, it the gold standard of trade deals. You, you know said what? it's the finest deal you've ever seen. No. And then you heard what I said about it, and all of a sudden you were against it. Well, Donald, I know you live in your own reality, but oh, yeah. that is not the facts. The facts are, I did say, I hoped it would be a good deal, but when it was negotiated, not. which I was not responsible for, I concluded it wasn't. I wrote about that. So is it President Obama's fault? Is it President Obama's you fault? Even announced. Look, there Secretary, are different. Secretary, is it President there, Obama's fault? There are because he's pushing it. There are different views about what's good for our country, our economy, and our leadership in the world. And I think it's important to look at what we need to do to get the economy going again. That's why I said new jobs with rising incomes, investments, not in more tax cuts that would add $5 trillion to the debt. But you have but no plan. Educate. Oh, I do. Secretary, in fact, you I have, have no plan. a book about it. It's called Stronger Together. You yeah. can pick it up That's tomorrow. That's about all you. At Folks, the bookstore <laughs> or at an airport near you. We're going to move to. Uh, but it's because I see this. We need to have strong growth fair growth, sustained growth. We also have to look at how we help families balance the responsibilities at home and the responsibilities at business. So we have a very robust set of plans, and people who have looked at both of our plans have concluded that mine would create 10 million jobs and yours would lose us three and a half million jobs and explode You are the going debt, to approve one of the biggest tax cuts in recession. history. You are going to approve one of the biggest tax increases in history. You are going to drive business out. Your regulations are a disaster, and you're going to increase regulations all over the place. And by the way, my tax cut is the biggest since Ronald Reagan. I'm very proud of it. It will create tremendous numbers of new jobs. But regulations, you are going to regulate these businesses out of existence. When I go around, Lester, I tell you this, I've been all over. And when I go around, despite the tax cut, the, thing, the things that business as and people like the most is the fact that I'm cutting regulation. You have regulations on top of regulations, and new companies cannot form, and old companies are going out of business, and you want to increase the regulations and make them even worse. I'm going to cut regulations, well, but I'm going to cut taxes, big league, and you're going to raise taxes, big league. End of story. Let me get you to pause right there, because we're going to yes, move, well, into, the, we're going that, to move into the next segment. Yeah, we're that, talk that, taxes. Can't, that can't be left Please to stand. Please take 30 you know, seconds. I, I kind on. of assumed that there would be a lot of these charges and claims. And so Facts. we have taken uh, the homepage of my website, HillaryClinton.com, and we've turned it into a fact checker. So if you want to see in real time, uh, what the facts are, please go and take a look. Because and take a I look at mine also, and you'll see. not add a penny to the debt, 
and your plans would add $5 trillion to the debt. What I have proposed would cut regulations and streamline them for small businesses. What I have proposed would be paid for by raising taxes on the wealthy because they have made all the gains in the economy. And I think it's time that the wealthy and corporations paid their fair share to support this. Well, country. you just opened the next segment. Well, well you just opened the next segment. Well, look, could I just I finish? Actually, I think I, need I, to, I, think need, I should. You're, I'm going to you give you a chance website, right here. With the and you take a look at her segment. website. She's going to raise taxes $1.3 trillion. Mr. Trump, I'm and look at her website. You know what? It's no different than this. She's telling us how to fight ISIS. Just go to her website. She tells you how to fight ISIS on her website. I don't think General Douglas MacArthur would like that right, too the much. Next, the, next, the next segment, we're continuing well, the subject of Well, at least I have a plan to fight ISIS. Prosperity. No, no. You're telling the enemy everything you want to do. No, we're not. See, you're no, telling the not. enemy everything we you are, want to do. Well, no wonder you've fighting. been fighting. No wonder you've been fighting ISIS Folks. your entire adult life. Folks, well, that, that's me, a that's let, go to the please the fact checkers get folks, to work. You are unpacking a lot here, and we're still in the issue of uh, achieving prosperity. And I want to talk about uh, taxes. Uh, the fundamental difference between the two of you concerns the wealthy. Secretary Clinton, you're calling for a tax increase in the wealthiest Americans. I'd like you to further defend that. And Mr. Trump, you're calling for tax cuts for the wealthy. I'd like you to defend that. And this next two-minute answer goes to you, Mr. Trump. Well, I'm really calling for major jobs because the wealthy are going to create tremendous jobs. They're going to expand their companies. They're going to do a tremendous job. I'm getting rid of the carried interest provision. And if you really look, it's not a tax. It's really not a great thing for the wealthy. It's a great thing for the middle class. It's a great thing for companies to expand. And when these people are going to put billions and billions of dollars into companies, and when they're going to bring two and a half trillion dollars back from overseas, where they can't bring the money back because politicians like Secretary Clinton won't allow them to bring the money back because the taxes are so onerous and the bureaucratic red tape So what is so bad. So what they're doing is they're leaving our country. And they're, believe it or not, leaving because taxes are too high and because some of them have lots of money outside of our country, and instead of bringing it back and putting the money to work because they can't work out a deal to, and everybody agrees it should be brought back, instead of that, they're leaving our country to get their money because they can't bring their money back into our country because of bureaucratic red tape, because they can't get together. Because we, we have a president that can't sit them around a table and get them to approve something. And here's the thing, Republicans and Democrats agree that this should be done. Two and a half trillion. I happen to think it's double that. It's probably five trillion dollars that we can't bring into our country, Lester. And with a little leadership, you'd get it in here very quickly, and it could be put to use on the inner cities and lots of other things, and it would be beautiful. But we have no leadership. And honestly, that starts with Secretary Clinton. All right, you have two minutes on the same question to defend tax increases on the wealthiest American, Secretary Clinton. I, I have a feeling that by the end of this evening, I'm going to be blamed for everything that's ever happened. Why not? Why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> jo you know, just, just, just join, uh, join the debate by uh, saying more crazy things. Now, let me it, say hey, There's nothing crazy is about not letting our companies case. bring their money it, back into okay, their this country. Is, this is uh, Secretary Clinton's two minutes, yes. please. Yeah, well, let's start the clock again, Lester. Um, we've looked at your tax proposals. I don't see changes in the corporate tax rates or the kinds of proposals you're referring to that would cause the repatriation, bringing back of money that's stranded overseas. I happen to then you support didn't read that. It. I happen to I happen to support that in a way that will actually work to our benefit. But when I look at what you have proposed, you have what is called now the Trump loophole, because it would so advantage you and the business you do. You've proposed a, an name? approach that ever. has a that $4 this our, this billion dollar tax minutes. benefit for your family. And when you look at what how you much, are how proposing, much for my family? it is, Lester, how as much? I said, trumped up trickle down. Trickle down did not work. It got us into the mess we were in in 2008 and nine. Slashing taxes on the wealthy hasn't worked, and a lot of really smart, wealthy people know that. And they are saying, hey, we need to do more to make the contributions we should be making 
to rebuild the middle class. I don't think top-down works in America. I think building the middle class, investing in the middle class, making college debt-free so more young people can get their education, helping people refinance their tax their, their debt from college at a lower rate. Those are the kinds of things that will really boost the economy. Broad-based, inclusive growth is what we need in America, not more advantages for people at the very top. Mr. Trump, we're Typical politician, all talk, no action, sounds good, doesn't work, never going to happen. Our country is suffering because people like Secretary Clinton have made such bad decisions in terms of our jobs and in terms of what's going on. Now, look, we have the worst revival of an economy since the Great Depression. And believe me, we're in a bubble right now. And the only thing that looks good is the stock market. But if you raise interest rates even a little bit, that's going to come crashing down. We are in a big, fat, ugly bubble. And we better be awfully careful. And we have a Fed that's doing political things. This Janet Yellen of the Fed. The Fed is doing political by keeping the interest rates at this level. And believe me, the day Obama goes off and he leaves and he goes out to the golf course for the rest of his life to play golf, when they raise interest rates, you're going to see some very bad things happen because the Fed is not doing their job. The Fed is being more political than Secretary Clinton. Mr. Trump, we're talking about the burden that Americans have to pay, yet you have not released your tax returns. And, and the reason nominees have, have released their returns for decades is so that voters will know if their potential president owes money to, who he know, owes it to, and any business conflicts. Uh, don't okay. Americans have a right to know if there are any conflicts of interest? I don't mind releasing. I'm under a routine audit, and it'll be released. And as soon as the audit's finished, it'll be released. But you will learn more about Donald Trump by going down to the federal elections, where I filed a 104-page, essentially financial statement of sorts, the forms that they have. It shows income. In fact, the income, I just looked today, the income is filed at $694 million for this past year. $694 million. If you would have told me I was going to make that 15 or 20 years ago, I would have been very surprised. But that's the kind of thinking that our country needs. When we have a country that's doing so badly, that's being ripped off by every single country in the world, it's the kind of thinking that our country needs because everybody, Lester, we have a trade deficit with all of the countries that we do business with of almost $800 billion a year. You know what that is? That means who's negotiating these trade deals? We have people that are political hacks negotiating our trade deals. The IRS says an me. audit of your taxes, uh, it's, you're perfectly free to release uh, your taxes during an audit. And so the question, does the public's right to know outweigh your personal... Well, I told you, I will release them as soon as the audit. Look, I've been under audit almost for 15 years. I know a lot of wealthy people that have never been audited. I said, do you get audited? I get audited almost every year. And in a way, I should be complaining. I'm not even complaining. I don't mind it. It's almost become a way of life. I get audited by the IRS. But other people don't. I will say this. Uh, we have a situation in this country that has to be taken care of. I will release my tax returns against my lawyer's wishes when she releases her 33,000 emails that have been deleted. As soon as she releases them, I will release, I will release my tax returns. And that's against my lawyers. They say, don't do it. I will tell you this. No, in fact, watching shows, to reading the papers. Almost every lawyer says, you don't release your returns until the audit's complete. When the audit's complete, I'll do it. But I would go against them if she releases her email. So it's negotiable? It's not negotiable. No, let her release the email. Why did she delete 33,000? Well, I'll let her ask that, but let me just uh, admonish the audience one more time. There was an agreement. We did ask you to be silent, so it would be helpful for us. Secretary Clinton. Well, I think you've just seen another example of bait and switch here. Um, for 40 years, everyone running for president has released their tax returns. You can go and see nearly, I think, 39, 40 years of our tax returns, but everyone has done it. We know the IRS has made clear there is no prohibition on releasing it when you're under audit. So you've got to ask yourself, why won't he release his tax returns? And I think there may be a couple of reasons. First, maybe he's not as rich as he says he is. Second, 
Maybe he's not as charitable as he claims to be. Third, we don't know all of his business dealings, but we have been told through investigative reporting that he owes about $650 million to Wall Street and foreign banks. Or maybe he doesn't want the American people, all of you watching tonight, to know that he's paid nothing in federal taxes, because the only years that anybody's ever seen were a couple of years when he had to turn them over to state authorities when he was trying to get a casino license, and they showed he didn't pay any federal income tax. So that makes if me he's smart. paid zero, that means zero for troops, zero for vets, zero for schools or health. And I think probably he's not uh, all that enthusiastic about having the rest of our country see uh, what the real reasons are, because it must be something really important, even terrible, that he's trying to hide. And the financial disclosure statement, they don't give you the tax rate. They don't give you all the details that tax returns would. And it just seems to me that this is something that the American people deserve to see. And I have no reason to believe that uh, he's ever going to release his tax returns, because there's something he's hiding. And we'll guess. We'll keep guessing at what it might be that he's hiding. Uh, but I think the question is, were he ever to get near the White House, what would be those conflicts? Who does he owe money to? Well, he owes you the answers to that, and he should provide them. He also, he also raised the issue of your emails. Do you want to respond to that? I do. You know, I made a mistake using a private email. That's for sure. Um, and if I had to do it over again, I would obviously do it differently. Um, but... I'm not going to make any excuses. It was a mistake, and I take responsibility for that. Mr. Trump? That was more than a mistake. That was done purposely, okay? That was not a mistake. That was done purposely. When you have your staff taking the Fifth Amendment, taking the Fifth so they're not prosecuted, when you have the man that set up the illegal server taking the Fifth, I think it's disgraceful. And believe me, this country thinks it's disgraceful. It really thinks it's disgraceful also. As far as my tax returns, you don't learn that much from tax returns, that I can tell you. You learn a lot from financial disclosure. And you should go down and take a look at that. The other thing, I'm extremely underleveraged. Uh, the report that said 650, which, by the way, a lot of friends of mine that know my business said, boy, that's really not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money relative to what I had. The buildings that were in question, they said in the same report, which was actually wasn't even a bad story, to be honest with you, but the buildings are worth $3.9 billion. And the 650 isn't even on that. But it's not 650. It's much less than that. But I could give you a list of banks. I would, if that would help you, I would give you a list of banks. These are very fine institutions, very fine banks. I could do that very quickly. I am very under leveraged. I have a great company. I have a tremendous income. And the reason I say that is not in a braggadocious way. It's because it's about time that this country had somebody running it that has an idea about money. When we have $20 trillion in debt and our country's a mess, you know, it's one thing to have $20 trillion in debt and our roads are good and our bridges are good and everything's in great shape, our airports. Our airports are like from a third world country. You land at LaGuardia, you land at Kennedy, you land at LAX, you land at Newark, and you come in from Dubai and Qatar and you see these incredible, you come in from China, you see these incredible airports, and you land, we become a third world country. So. The worst of all things has happened. We owe $20 trillion, and we're a mess. We haven't even started. And we've spent $6 trillion in the Middle East, according to a report that I just saw, whether it's six or five, but it looks like it's six. Six trillion dollars in the Middle East. We could have rebuilt our country twice. And it's really a shame. And it's politicians like Secretary Clinton that have caused this problem. Our country has tremendous problems. We're a debtor nation. We're a serious debtor nation. And we have a country that needs new roads, new tunnels, new bridges, new airports, new schools, new hospitals. And we don't have the money because it's been squandered on so many of your ideas. But you're and maybe we'll because you haven't paid any federal income tax for a lot of years. And the other thing I think is important It would to be squandered, too, believe me. If your, if your main claim to be president of the United States is your business, then I think we should talk about that. 
You know, your campaign manager said that you built a lot of businesses on the backs of little guys. And indeed, I have met a lot of the people who were stiffed by you and your businesses, Donald. I've met dishwashers, painters, architects, glass installers, marble installers, drapery installers, like my dad was, who you refused to pay when they finished the work that you asked them to do. We have an architect in the audience who designed one of your clubhouses at one of your golf courses. It's a beautiful facility. It immediately was put to use, and you wouldn't pay what the man needed to be paid what he was charging you Maybe he do. didn't do a good job, and I was well, unsatisfied with do, his work, do which our country do the, should do, do the too. thousands of people that you have stiffed over the course of your business not deserve some kind of apology from someone who has taken their labor, taken the goods that they produced, and then refused to pay them? I can only say that I'm certainly relieved that my late father never did business with you. Uh, he provided a good middle-class life for us, but the people he worked for, he expected the bargain to be kept on both sides. And when we talk about your business, you've taken business bankruptcy six times. There are a lot of great business people that have never taken bankruptcy once. You call yourself the king of debt. You talk about leverage. You even at one time suggested that you would try to negotiate down the Wrong. national debt of the Wrong. United States. Well, sometimes there's not a direct transfer of skills from business to government, but sometimes what happened in business would be really bad for government. That's what Mr. And Trump we need so, yeah, to I think be it's, very I do clear think it's about that. Look. It's all words, it's all sound bites. I built an unbelievable company, some of the greatest assets anywhere in the world, real estate assets anywhere in the world, beyond the United States, in Europe, lots of different places. It's an unbelievable company. But on occasion, four times, we used certain laws that are there. And when Secretary Clinton talks about people that didn't get paid, first of all, they did get paid a lot but taking advantage of the laws of the nation. Now, if you want to change the laws, you've been there a long time, change the laws. But I take advantage of the laws of the nation because I'm running a company. My obligation right now is to do well for myself, my family, my employees, for my companies. And that's what I do. But what she doesn't say is the tens of thousands of people that are unbelievably happy and that love me. I'll give you an example. We're just opening up on Pennsylvania Avenue, right next to the White House. So if I don't get there one way, I'm going to get to Pennsylvania Avenue another. But we're opening the old post office. Under budget, ahead of schedule, saved tremendous money. I'm a year ahead of schedule. And that's what this country should be doing. We build roads and they cost two and three and four times what they're supposed to cost. We buy products for our military and they come in at costs that are so far above what they were supposed to be because we don't have people that know what they're doing. When we look at the budget, the budget is bad to a large extent because we have people that have no idea as to what to do and how to buy. The Trump International is way under budget and way ahead of schedule. And we should be able to do that for our Well, country. we're well behind schedule, so I want to move to our next segment. Uh, we move into our next segment talking about America's direction, and let's start by talking about race. The share of Americans who say race relations are bad in this country is the highest it's been in decades, much of it amplified by shootings of African Americans by police, as we've seen recently in Charlotte and Tulsa. Race has been a big issue in this campaign, and one of you is going to have to bridge a very wide and bitter gap. So how do you heal the divide? Secretary Clinton, you get two minutes on this. Well, you're right. Race remains a significant challenge in our country. Unfortunately, race still determines too much, often determines where people live, determines what kind of education in their public schools they can get, and yes, it determines how they're treated in the criminal justice system. We've just seen those two tragic examples in both Tulsa and Charlotte. And we've got to do several things at the same time. 
We have to restore trust between communities and the police. We have to work to make sure that our police are using the best training, the best techniques, that they're well prepared to use force only when necessary. Everyone should be respected by the law, and everyone should respect the law. Right now, that's not the case in a lot of our neighborhoods. So I have, ever since the first day of my campaign, called for criminal justice reform. I've laid out a platform that I think would begin to remedy some of the problems we have in the criminal justice system. But we also have to recognize, in addition to the challenges that we face with policing, there are so many good, brave police officers who equally want reform. So we have to bring communities together in order to begin working on that as a mutual goal. And we've got to get guns out of the hands of people who should not have them. The gun epidemic is the leading cause of death of young African-American men, more than the next nine causes put together. So we have to do two things, as I said. We have to restore trust. We have to work with the police. We have to make sure they respect the communities and the communities respect them. And we have to tackle the plague of gun violence, which is a big contributor to a lot of the problems that we're seeing today. All right, Mr. Trump, you have two minutes. How do you heal the divide? Well, first of all, Secretary Clinton doesn't want to use a couple of words, and that's law and order. And we need law and order. If we don't have it, we're not going to have a country. And when I look at what's going on in Charlotte, a city I love, a city where I have investments, when I look at what's going on throughout various parts of our country, whether it's, I mean, I can just keep naming them all day long. We need law and order in our country. And I just got today uh, the, as you know, the endorsement of the Fraternal Order of Police. We just, uh, just came in. Uh, we have endorsements from, I think, almost every police group, very, I mean, a large percentage of them in the United States. Uh, we have a situation where we have uh, our inner cities, African-Americans, Hispanics, are living in hell because it's so dangerous. You walk down the street, you get shot. In Chicago, they've had thousands of shootings, thousands, since January 1st. Thousands of shootings. And I'm saying, where is this? Is this a war-torn country? What are we doing? And we have to stop the violence. We have to bring back law and order. In a place like Chicago, where thousands of people have been killed, thousands over the last number of years. In fact, almost 4,000 have been killed since Barack Obama became president. Over four, almost 4,000 people in Chicago have been killed. We have to bring back law and order. Now, whether or not in a place like Chicago you do stop and frisk, which worked very well, Mayor Giuliani is here, it worked very well in New York, it brought the crime rate way down. But you take the gun away from criminals that shouldn't be having it. We have gangs roaming the street, and in many cases, they're illegally here, illegal immigrants, and they have guns, and they shoot people. And we have to be very strong, and we have to be very vigilant. We have to, be, we have to know what we're doing. Right now, our police, in many cases, are afraid to do anything. We have to protect our inner cities because African-American communities are being decimated your, by crime. Your two, decimated. Minutes is, your two minutes expired, but I do want to follow up. Stop and frisk was ruled unconstitutional in New York because it, it largely singled out black and Hispanic young men. No, it, you're wrong. Uh, it went before a judge who was a very against police judge. Uh, it was taken away from her, and our mayor, our new mayor, refused to go forward with the case. They would have won an appeal. If you look at it throughout the country, there are many places the, where The it's argument allowed. is that it is, it's a form of racial profiling. No, the argument is that we have to take the guns away from these people that have them and that are bad people that shouldn't have them. These are felons. These are people that are bad people that shouldn't be... When you have 3,000 shootings in Chicago from January 1st, when you have 4,000 people killed in Chicago by guns from the beginning of the presidency of Barack Obama, his hometown, you have to have stop and frisk. You need more police. You need a better community 
you know, uh, relation. You don't have good community relations in Chicago. It's terrible. I have property there. It's terrible what's going on in Chicago. But when you look, and Chicago's not the only, you go to Ferguson, you go to so many different places. You need better relationships, I agree with, Secretary Clinton on this. You need better relationships between the communities and the police, because in some cases it's not good. But you look at Dallas, where the relationships were really studied. The relationships were really a beautiful thing. And then five police officers were killed one night very violently. So there's some bad things going on, some really bad things. Secretary Clinton, but we in. need, Lester, we need law and order. And we need law and order in the inner cities because the people that are most affected by what's happening are African-American and Hispanic people. And it's very unfair to them what our politicians are allowing to happen. Secretary Clinton. Well, I've heard, um, I've heard Donald say this um, at his rallies, and it's, it's really unfortunate that he paints such a dire negative picture of black communities in our country. Oh. You know, the vibrancy of the black church, the black businesses that employ so many people, uh, the opportunities that so many families are working to provide for their kids. Uh, there's a lot that we should be proud of and we should be supporting and lifting up. But we do always have to make sure we keep people safe. There are the right ways of doing it, and then there are ways that are ineffective. Stop and frisk was found to be unconstitutional, and in part because it was ineffective. It did not do what it needed to do. Now, I believe in community policing, and in fact, violent crime is one half of what it was in 1991. Property crime is down 40 percent. We just don't want to see it creep back up. We've had 25 years of very good cooperation, but there were some problems, some unintended consequences. Too many young African-American and Latino men ended up in jail for nonviolent offenses. And it's just a fact that if you're a young African-American man and you do the same thing as a young white man, you are more likely to be arrested, charged, convicted, and incarcerated. So we've got to address the systemic racism in our criminal justice system. We cannot just say law and order. We have to say, we, we have to come forward with a plan that is going to divert people from the criminal justice system, deal with mandatory minimum sentences, which have put too many people away for too long for doing too little. We need to have more second chance programs. I'm glad that we're ending private prisons in the federal system. I want to see them ended in the state system. You shouldn't have a profit motivation to fill prison cells with young Americans. So there are some positive ways we can work on this. And I believe strongly that common sense gun safety measures would assist us right now. And this is something Donald has supported along with the gun lobby right now We've got too many military-style weapons on the streets. In a lot of places, our police are outgunned. We need comprehensive background checks, and we need to keep guns out of the hands of those who will do harm. And we finally need to pass a prohibition on anyone who's on the terrorist watch list from being able to buy a gun in our country. If you're too dangerous to fly, you are too dangerous to buy a gun. So there are things we can do, and we ought to do it in a bipartisan Sec way. Secretary Clinton, last week you said we've got to do everything possible to improve policing, to go right at implicit bias. Do you believe that police are implicitly biased against black people? Lester, I think implicit bias is a problem for everyone, not just police. I think, unfortunately, too many of us in our great country um, jump to conclusions about each other. And therefore, I think we need all of us to be asking hard questions about, you know, why am I feeling this way? But when it comes to policing, since it can have literally fatal consequences, I have said in my first budget, we would put money into that budget to help us deal with implicit bias by retraining a lot of our police officers. I've met with a group of very distinguished, experienced police chiefs a few weeks ago. 
they admit it's an issue. They've got a lot of concerns. Mental health is one of the biggest concerns because now police are having to handle a lot of really difficult mental health problems on the street. They want support. They want more training. They want more assistance. And I think the federal government could be in a position where we would uh, offer and provide that. Mr. I'd like to respond. Please. First of all, uh, I agree, and a lot of people, even within my own party, want to give uh, certain rights to people on watch lists and no-fly lists. I agree with you. When a person is on a watch list or a no-fly list, and I have the endorsement of the NRA, which I'm very proud of. These are very, very good people, and they're protecting the Second Amendment. But uh, I think we have to look very strongly at no-fly lists and watch lists. And when people are on there, even if they shouldn't be on there, we'll help them. We'll help them legally. We'll help them get off. But I tend to agree with that uh, quite strongly. I do want to bring up the fact that you were the one that brought up the word super predator about young black youth. And that's a term that I think was a, uh, it's, hor it's been horribly met, as you know. I think you've apologized for it. But uh, I think it was a terrible thing to say. And when it comes to uh, stop and frisk, you know, you're talking about taking guns away. Well, I'm talking about taking guns away from gangs and people that use them. And I don't think, I really don't think you disagree with me on this, if you want to know the truth. I think maybe there's a political reason why you can't say it, but I really don't believe. In New York City, stop and frisk, we had 2,200 murders, and stop and frisk brought it down to 500 murders. 500 murders is a lot of murders. Hard to believe. 500 is, like, supposed to be good. But we went from 2,200 to 500, and it was continued on by Mayor Bloomberg, and it was terminated by current mayor. But stop and fit frisk had a tremendous impact on the safety of New York City, tremendous beyond belief. So when you say it has no impact, it really did. It had a very, very big impact. Well, it's also fair to say, if we're going to talk about uh, mayors, that under the current mayor, crime has continued to drop, including murders. So there uh, you're is... Wrong. You're wrong. No, I'm murders not. Murders are up. All right, you'll check. New York, New York has you'll done an excellent job. And I give credit. I give credit across the board going back uh, to mayors, to police uh, chiefs, because it has worked. And other communities need to come together to do what will work uh, as well. Look, one murder is too many. But it True. is important that we learn about what has been effective and not go to things that sound good that really did not have the kind of impact that we would want. Who disagrees with keeping neighborhoods safe? But let's also add, no one should disagree about respecting the rights of young men who live in those neighborhoods. And so we need to do a better job of working again with the communities, faith communities, business communities, as well as the police to try to deal with this problem. This conversation is about race, and so, Mr. Trump, I have to ask but you. But I'd like to five, just respond, if for, I might. For, for, please, oh, 20 I'd seconds. I'd just like to respond. Please respond, then I've got to follow up. I will. Up uh, look, the African American community has been let down by our politicians. They talk good around election time, like right now, and after the election, they said, see you later, I'll see you in four years. The African American community, look, the community within the inner cities has been so badly treated. They've been abused and used in order to get votes by Democrat politicians, because that's what it is. They've controlled these communities right. for up to 100 years. Mr. Trump, let me... Well, unbroken. I, I, I and, and I will tell you, you look at the inner cities, and I just left Detroit, and I just left Philadelphia, and I just, you know, you've seen me. I've been all over the place. Uh, you decided to stay home, and that's okay. But I will tell you, I've been all over, and I've met some of the greatest people I'll ever meet within these communities, and they are very, very upset with what their politicians have told them and what their politicians have done. Mr. Trump, I, I, think, I think that I think Donald just criticized me for preparing for this debate. And yes, I did. And you know what else I prepared for? I prepared to be president, and I think that's a good thing. Mr. Trump, for five years, you perpetuated a false claim that the nation's first black president was not a natural-born citizen. You questioned his legitimacy. In the last couple of weeks, you acknowledge what most Americans have accepted for years. The president was born in the United States. Can you tell us what took you so I'll, I'll tell you very, well, just very simple to say. Uh, Sidney Blumenthal works for the campaign and close, very close friend of Secretary Clinton. 
and uh, her campaign manager, Patty Doyle, went to, during the campaign, her campaign against President Obama, fought very hard, and you can go look it up, and you can check it out, and if you look at CNN this past week, Patty Solis Doyle was on Wolf Blitzer saying that this happened. Uh, Blumenthal sent Matlachi, highly respected reporter at Matlachi, to Kenya to find out about it. They were pressing it very hard. She failed to get the birth certificate. When I got involved, I didn't fail. I got him to give the birth certificate. So I'm satisfied with it. And I'll tell you why I'm satisfied with it. That was because I want to get on to defeating ISIS. Because I want to get on to creating jobs. Because I want to get on to having a strong border. Because I want to get on to things that are very important to me and that are very important to the country. I, I'll let you respond. That's important. But I just want to get the answer here. The birth certificate was produced in 2011. You continued to tell the story and question the president's legitimacy in 2012, 13, 14, 15, yeah. as recently as January. So the question is, what changed your well, mind? Well, nobody was pressing it. Nobody was caring much about it. I figured you'd ask the question tonight, of course. But nobody was caring much about it. Uh, but I was the one that got him to produce uh, the birth certificate. And I think I did a good job. Uh, Secretary Clinton also fought it. I mean, you know, now everybody in mainstream is going to say, oh, that's not true. Look, it's true. Sidney Blumenthal sent a reporter. Uh, you just have to take a look at CNN, the last week, the interview with your former campaign manager. And she was involved. But just like she can't bring back jobs, she can't produce. I I'm sorry. I'm just going to follow up. And I will let you respond to that, because if there's a lot there. But we're talking about racial healing in this segment. What do you say to Americans? Well, it was very, I say nothing. I say nothing because I was able to get him to produce it. He should have produced it a long time before. I say nothing. But let me just tell you, when you talk about healing, I think that I've developed very, very good relationships over the last little while with the African-American community. I think you can see that. And I feel that they really wanted me to come to that conclusion. And I think I did a great job and a great service, not only for the country, but even for the president, in getting him to produce his birth certificate. Secretary Clinton. Well, just listen to what you heard. <laughs> and clearly, as Donald just admitted, he knew he was going to stand on this debate stage and Lester Holt was going to be asking us questions. So he tried to put the whole racist birther lie to bed. But it can't be dismissed that easily. He has really started his political activity based on this racist lie that our first black president was not an American citizen. There was absolutely no evidence for it, but he persisted. He persisted year after year because some of his Supporters, people that he was trying to bring into his fold, apparently believed it or wanted to believe it. But remember, Donald started his career back in 1973 being sued by the Justice Department for racial discrimination because he would not rent apartments in one of his developments to African Americans, and he made sure that the people who worked for him understood that was the policy. He actually was sued twice by the Justice Department. So he has a long record of engaging in racist behavior. <laughs> and the birther lie was a very hurtful one. You know, Barack Obama is a man of great dignity. And I could tell how much it bothered him and annoyed him that this was being touted and used against him. But I like to remember what Michelle Obama said in her amazing speech at our Democratic National Convention. When they go low, we go high. And Barack Obama went high, despite Donald Trump's best efforts to bring him down. Mr. Trump, you can respond, then we're going to move on I to the next I would love segment. to respond. First of all, I got to watch, in preparing for this, some of your debates against Barack Obama. You treated him with terrible disrespect. And I watch the way you talk now about how lovely everything is and how wonderful you are. It doesn't work that way. You were after 
him, you were trying to, you even sent out, or your campaign sent out pictures of him in a certain garb, very famous pictures, I don't think you can deny that. But just last week, your campaign manager said it was true. So when you try to act holier than thou, it really doesn't work. It really doesn't. Now, as far as the lawsuit, yes, when I was very young, I went into my father's company, had a real estate company in Brooklyn and Queens, and we, along with many, many other companies throughout the country, as a federal lawsuit, were sued. We settled the suit with zero, with no admission of guilt. It was very easy to do, but they sued many people. I notice you bring that up a lot, and, uh, you know, I also notice the very nasty commercials that you do on me in so many different ways, which I don't do on you. Maybe I'm trying to save the money. But frankly, I look, I look at that and I say, isn't that amazing? Because I settled that lawsuit with no admission of guilt. But that was a lawsuit brought against many real estate firms, and it's just one of those things. I'll go on one step further. In Palm Beach, Florida, tough community, a brilliant community, a wealthy community, probably the wealthiest community there is in the world. I opened a club and really got great credit for it. No discrimination against African Americans, against Muslims, against anybody. And it's a tremendously successful club, and I'm so glad I did it. And I have been given great credit for what I did, and I'm very, very proud of it. And that's the way I feel. That is the true way I feel. Our next segment is called Securing America. We want to start with a 21st century war happening every day in this country. Our institutions are under cyber attack, and our secrets are being stolen. So my question is, who's behind it, and how do we fight it? Secretary Clinton, this answer goes to you. Well, I think cybersecurity Cyber warfare will be one of the biggest challenges facing the next president because clearly we're facing at this point uh, two different kinds of adversaries. There are the independent hacking groups that do it mostly for uh, commercial reasons to try to steal information that they then can use to make money. But increasingly we are seeing cyber attacks coming from states, organs of states, the most recent and troubling of these has been Russia. There's no doubt now that Russia has used cyber attacks against all kinds of organizations in our country, and I am deeply concerned about this. I know Donald's uh, very praise, praiseworthy of uh, Vladimir Putin, but Putin is playing a really tough, long game here. And one of the things he's done is to let loose uh, cyber attackers, to hack into government uh, files, to hack into personal files, hack into the Democratic National Committee. And we recently uh, have learned that, you know, that this is one of their uh, preferred methods of trying to wreak havoc and collect information. We need to make it very clear, whether it's Russia, China, Iran, or anybody else, the United States has much greater capacity and we are not going to sit idly by and permit state actors to go after our information, our private sector information or our public sector information. And we're going to have to make it clear that we don't want to use the kinds of tools that we have. We don't want to engage in a different kind of warfare, but we will defend the citizens of this country. And the Russians need to understand that. I think they've been treating it as almost a, a probing. Uh, how far would we go? How much would we do? And that's why I was, so, I was so shocked when Donald publicly invited Putin to hack into Americans. That is, that is just unacceptable. It's one of the reasons why 50 national security officials who served in Republican information in, in administration have said that Donald is unfit to be the commander in chief. It's comments like that that really worry people who understand the threats that we face. Mr. Trump, you have two minutes in the same question. Yeah, Who's behind it? I, and how do I, we I do it? want to say that I was just endorsed and more are coming next week. It'll be over 200 admirals. Many of them are here. Admirals and generals endorsed me to lead this country. Uh, that just happened, and many more are coming, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, in addition, I was just endorsed by ICE. They've never endorsed anybody before on immigration. 
Uh, I was just endorsed by ICE. I was just recently endorsed 16,500 Border Patrol agents. So when uh, Secretary Clinton talks about this, I mean, I'll take the admirals and I'll take the generals any day over the political hacks that I see that have led our country so brilliantly over the last 10 years with their knowledge, okay? Because look at the mess that we're in. Look at the mess that we're in. As far as the cyber, I agree to parts of what Secretary Clinton said. Uh, we should be better than anybody else, and perhaps we're not. I don't think anybody knows it was Russia that broke into the DNC. She's saying Russia, 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 but I don't, maybe it was. I mean, it could be Russia, but it could also be China. It could also be lots of other people. It also could be somebody sitting on their bed that weighs 400 pounds, okay? You don't know who broke in to DNC, but what did we learn with DNC? We learned that Bernie Sanders was taken advantage of by your people by Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Look what happened to her. But Bernie Sanders was taken advantage of. That's what we lose. Now, whether that was Russia, whether that was China, whether it was another country, we don't know. Because the truth is, under President Obama, we've lost control of things that we used to have control over. We came in with the internet, we came up with the internet, and I think Secretary Clinton and myself would agree very much when you look at what ISIS is doing with the internet, they're beating us at our own game, ISIS. So we have to get very, very tough on cyber and cyber warfare. Uh, it, is a, it is a huge problem. I have a son. He's 10 years old. He has computers. He is so good with these computers. It's unbelievable. The security aspect of cyber is very, very tough. And maybe it's, it's hardly doable. But I will say, we are not doing the job we should be doing. But that's true throughout our whole governmental society. We have so many things that we have to do better, Lester, and certainly cyber is one of them. Secretary Clinton. Well, I think there are a number of issues that uh, we should be addressing. Um, I have put forth a plan to defeat ISIS. Uh, it does involve going after them online. I think we need to do much more uh, with our tech companies to uh, prevent ISIS and their operatives uh, from being able to use the internet to radicalize, even direct uh, people in our country, in Europe, and elsewhere. But we also have to intensify our air strikes against ISIS uh, and eventually support our Arab and Kurdish uh, partners to be able to actually take out ISIS uh, in Raqqa and their claim of being a caliphate. We're making progress. Our military is assisting in Iraq, uh, and we're hoping that uh, within the year we'll be able to push ISIS out of Iraq and then, you know, really squeeze them in Syria. Uh, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that they've had foreign fighters coming to uh, volunteer for them, foreign money, uh, foreign weapons. So we have to make this the top priority, and I would also uh, do everything possible to take out their leadership. I was involved in a number of efforts to take out al-Qaeda leadership when I was Secretary of State, including, of course, taking out bin Laden. And I think we need to go after Baghdadi uh, as well, make that one of our organizing principles, because we've got to defeat ISIS and we've got to do everything we can to disrupt their uh, propaganda efforts online. You mentioned ISIS, and we think of ISIS certainly as over there, but there are American citizens who have been inspired to commit acts of terror on American soil. The latest incident, of course, the bombings we just saw in uh, New York and New Jersey, the knife attack at a mall in Minnesota, and the last year, deadly attacks in San Bernardino and Orlando. I'll ask this to both of you. Tell us specifically how you would prevent homegrown attacks by American citizens, Mr. Trump. Well, well first I have to say one thing, very important. Secretary Clinton is talking about taking out ISIS. We will take out ISIS. Well, President Obama and Secretary Clinton created a vacuum the way they got out of Iraq. Because they got out, they shouldn't have been in, but once they got in, the way they got out was a disaster. And ISIS was formed. So she talks about taking them out. She's been doing it a long time. She's been trying to take them out for a long time. But they wouldn't have even been formed if they left some troops behind like 10,000 or maybe something more than that. And then you wouldn't have had them. Or, as I've been saying for a long time, and I think you'll agree because I said it to you once, had we taken the oil, and we should have taken the oil, 
ISIS would not have been able to form either because the oil was their primary source of income. And now they have the oil all over the place, including the oil, a lot of the oil in Libya, which was another one of her disasters. Secretary Clinton. Well, I hope the fact checkers are turned up and turning up the volume and really working hard. Donald supported the invasion of Iraq. Wrong. That is absolutely Wrong. proved over and over again. Wrong. We actually advocated for the actions we took in Libya and urged that uh, Gaddafi be taken out after actually doing some business with him one time. But the larger point, he says this constantly, is George W. Bush made the agreement about when American troops would leave Iraq, not Barack Obama. And the only way that American troops could have stayed in Iraq is to get an agreement from the then Iraqi government that would have protected our troops. And the Iraqi government would not give that. But let's talk about the question you asked, Lester. The question you asked is, what do we do here in the United States? That's the most important part of this. How do we prevent attacks? How do we protect our people? And I think we've got to have an intelligence surge where we are looking for every scrap of information. I was so proud of law enforcement in New York, in uh, Minnesota, in New Jersey. You know, they responded so quickly, so professionally to the attacks uh, that occurred by Rahami and they brought him down. And we may find out more information because he is still alive, which may prove to be an intelligence uh, benefit. So we've got to do everything we can to vacuum up intelligence from Europe, from the Middle East. That means we've got to work more closely with our allies. And that's something that Donald has been very dismissive of. We're working with NATO, the longest military alliance in the history of the world to really turn our attention to terrorism. We're working with our friends in the Middle East, many of which, as you know, are Muslim majority nations. Donald has consistently insulted Muslims abroad, Muslims at home, when we need to be cooperating with Muslim nations and with the American Muslim community. They're on the front lines. They can provide information to us that we might not get anywhere else. They need to have close working cooperation with law enforcement in these communities, not be alienated and pushed away, uh, as some of uh, Donald's rhetoric, unfortunately, has uh, led to. Mr. Mr. Well, well, I'd have to respond. Please respond. The, uh, the secretary said very strongly about working with. We've been working with them for many years. And we have the greatest mess anyone's ever seen. You look at the Middle East, it's a total mess, under your direction to a large extent. But you look at the Middle East, you started the Iran deal, that's a, another beauty, where you have a country that was ready to fall. I mean, they were doing so badly. They were choking on the sanctions, and now they're going to be actually probably a major power at some point pretty soon, the way they're going. But when you look at NATO, I was asked on a major show, what do you think of NATO? Now, you have to understand, I'm a business person. I did really well, but I have common sense. And I said, well, I'll tell you, I haven't given lots of thought to NATO, but two things. Number one, the 28 countries of NATO, many of them aren't paying their fair share. Number two, and that bothers me because we should be, yes, we're defending them and they should at least be paying us what they're supposed to be paying by treaty and contract. And number two, I said, and very strongly, NATO could be obsolete because, and I was very strong on this, and it was actually covered very accurately in the New York Times, which is unusual for the New York Times, to be honest. But I said, they do not focus on terror. And I was very strong, and I said it numerous times, and about four months ago, I read on the front page of the Wall Street Journal that NATO is opening up a major terror division. And I think that's great. And I think we should get because we pay approximately 73 percent of the cost of NATO. It's a lot of money to protect other people. But I'm all for NATO. But I said they have to focus on terror also. And they're going to do that. And that was, believe me, I'm sure I'm not going to get credit for it, but that was largely because of what I was saying and my criticism of NATO. I think we have to get NATO to go into the Middle East with us in addition to surrounding nations, and we have to knock the hell out of ISIS, and we have to do it fast. When ISIS formed in this vacuum created by Barack Obama and Secretary Clinton, and believe me, 
You were the ones that took out the troops. Not only that, you named the day. They couldn't believe it. They sat back probably and said, well, I Lester, can't believe it. They said, no, wait a minute. We've covered when this they formed, When they formed, this is something that never should have happened. It should have never happened. Now, you're talking about taking out ISIS, but you were there and you were Secretary of State when it was a little infant. Now it's in over 30 countries. And you're going to stop them? I don't think so. Mr. Trump, you, with it, a lot of these are judgment questions. You had supported the war in Iraq before the invasion. What makes your judgment? I did not what, support what, the in war two, in Iraq. 2002. That is a mainstream media nonsense put out by her because she, frankly, I think the best person in her campaign is mainstream media. My question Just, is, since you, you would supported you like to hear? why is your I was why against your the war. Wait a minute. I was against the war in Iraq, just so you put it out. The record shows I, otherwise. The record but why does is, not show why that. Why you, is your the judgment The record any... shows that I'm right. When I did an interview with Howard Stern, very lightly, first time anyone's asked me that, I said, very lightly, I don't know, maybe, who knows, essentially. I then did an interview with Neil Cavuto. We talked about the economy is more important. I then spoke to Sean Hannity, which everybody refuses to call Sean Hannity. I had numerous conversations with Sean Hannity at Fox. And Sean Hannity said, and he called me the other day, and I spoke to him about it. He said, you were totally against war, because he was for the war. Why is and your we, excuse judgment me, better than And that was before the war started. Sean Hannity said very strongly to me and other people, he's willing to say, but nobody wants to call him, I was against the war. He said, you used to have fights with me because Sean was in favor of the war. And I understand that side also, not very much, because we should have never been there. But nobody called Sean Hannity. And then they did an article in a major magazine shortly after the war started, I think in 04, but they did an article which had me totally against the war in Iraq. And one of your compatriots said, you know, whether it was before or right after, Trump was definitely, because if you read this article, there's no doubt. But if somebody, and I'll ask the press, if somebody would call up Sean Hannity, this was before the war started, he and I used to have arguments about the war. I said it's a terrible and a stupid thing. It's going to destabilize the Middle East, and that's exactly what it's done. It's my, been my, a disaster. My reference was to what you had said in 2002, and my question was, no, no, why, is you didn't hear what I said. why is your judgment any different than... Mrs. Clinton. Well, I have much better judgment than she does. There's no question about that. I also have a much better temperament than she has. You know, I have a much better. She spent, let me tell you, she spent hundreds of millions of dollars on an advertising. You know, they get Madison Avenue into a room, they put names. Oh, temperament, let's go after. I think my strongest asset, maybe by far, is my temperament. I have a winning temperament. I know how to win. She does not have Secretary how to win. Clinton. Wait. The AFL-CIO, the other day, <clears throat> behind the blue screen, I don't know who you were talking to, Secretary Clinton, but you were totally out of control. I said, there's a person with a temperament that's got a problem. Secretary Clinton. Whoa, OK. <laughs> let's um, let, let's uh, talk about two important issues that were briefly mentioned by Donald. First, NATO. You know, NATO, as a military alliance, has something called Article 5, and basically it says this, an attack on one is an attack on all. And do you know the only time it's ever been invoked? After 9-11, when the 28 nations of NATO said that they would go to Afghanistan with us to fight terrorism, something that they still are doing by our side. With respect to Iran, when I became Secretary of State, Iran was weeks away from having enough nuclear material to form a bomb. They had mastered the nuclear fuel cycle under the Bush administration. They had built covert facilities. They had stocked them with centrifuges that were whirling away. And we had sanctioned them. I voted for every sanction against Iran when I was in the Senate, but it wasn't enough. So I spent a year and a half putting together a coalition that included Russia and China to impose the toughest sanctions on Iran. And we did drive them to the negotiating table. And my successor, John Kerry, and President Obama got a deal that put a lid on Iran's nuclear program without firing a single shot. That's diplomacy. That's coalition building. That's working with other nations. The other day, I saw Donald saying that 
There were some Iranian sailors on a ship in the waters off of Iran, and they were taunting American sailors who were on a nearby ship. He said, you know, if they taunted our sailors, I'd blow them out of the water and start another war. That's that would not, not good judgment. War. That is not the right temperament to be commander in chief, to be taunted. And the worst part no, of what we heard us. Donald say has been about nuclear weapons. He has said repeatedly that he didn't care if other nations got nuclear weapons, Japan, South Korea, even Saudi Arabia. It has been the policy of the United States, Democrats and Republicans, to do everything we could to reduce the proliferation of nuclear weapons. He even said, well, you know, if there were a nuclear war in the East Asia, well, you know, that's fine. You know, well, have a good time, folks. And in fact, his cavalier attitude about nuclear weapons is so deeply troubling. That is the number one threat we face in the world, and it becomes particularly threatening if terrorists ever get their hands on any nuclear material. So a man who can be provoked by a tweet should not have his fingers anywhere near the nuclear codes, as far as I think anyone with any sense about this should be concerned. That line's getting a little bit old, I must say. Listen, it's a good one, I, though. I would like to, well no, describes not, the problem. Not a, it's not an accurate one at all. It's not an accurate one. So I just want to give a lot of things and just to respond. I agree with her on one thing. The single greatest problem the world has is nuclear armament, nuclear weapons. Not global warming like you think and your, your president thinks. Uh, nuclear is the single greatest threat. Uh, just to go down the list, uh, we defend Japan, we defend Germany, we defend South Korea, we defend Saudi Arabia, we defend countries. They do not pay us what they should be paying us because we are providing tremendous service and we're losing a fortune. That's why we're losing, we're losing, we lose on everything. I say, who makes these? We lose on everything. Well, I said that it's very possible that if they don't pay a fair share, because this isn't 40 years ago where we could do what we're doing. We can't defend Japan, a, a behemoth selling us cars by the million. We need to move on. Oh, wait, but it's very important. All I said was they may have to defend themselves or they have to help us out. We're a country that owes $20 trillion. They have to help us out. Our, our as less far as the nuclear is concerned, I agree. It is the single greatest threat that this country has. Which leads to my next question as we enter our last segment here on the still on the subject of securing America. On nuclear weapons, President Obama reportedly considered changing the nation's longstanding policy on first use. Do you support the current policy? Mr. Trump, you have two minutes on that. Well, I have to say that, uh, you know, for what Secretary Clinton was saying about nuclear with Russia, she's very cavalier in the way she talks about various countries. But Russia has been expanding. They're, they have a much newer capability than we do. We have not been uh, updating from the new standpoint. I looked the other night, I was seeing B-52s. They're old enough that your, your father, your grandfather could be flying them. Uh, we, are not, we are not keeping up with other countries. I would like everybody to end it, just get rid of it. Uh, but I would certainly not do first strike. I think that once the nuclear alternative happens, it's over. At the same time, we have to be prepared. I can't take anything off the table because you look at some of these countries, you look at North Korea, uh, we're doing nothing there. China should solve that problem for us. China should go into North Korea. China is, is totally powerful as it relates to North Korea. And by the way, another one powerful is the worst deal I think I've ever seen negotiated that you started is the Iran deal. Iran is one of their biggest trading partners. Iran has power over North Korea. And when they made that horrible deal with Iran, they should have included the fact that they do something with respect to North Korea. And they should have done something with respect to Yemen and all these other places. And when asked to Secretary Kerry, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you do add other things into the deal? One of the great giveaways of all time, of all time, including $400 million in cash Nobody's ever seen that before. That turned out to be wrong. It was actually $1.7 billion in cash. Obviously, I guess, for the hostages, it certainly looks that way. So you say to yourself, why didn't they make the right deal? This is one of the worst deals 
ever made by any country in history. The deal with Iran will lead to nuclear problems. All they have to do is sit back 10 years, and they don't have to do you're, much, you're and they're going to end up inspired. getting nuclear. I met with Bibi Netanyahu the other day. Believe me, he is not a happy camper. All right. Mrs. Uh, well, Clinton, Secretary Clinton, you have two minutes. Let me, let, me, let me start by saying words matter. Words matter when you run for president, and they really matter when you are president. And I want to reassure our allies in Japan and South Korea and elsewhere that we have mutual defense treaties and we will honor them. It is essential that America's word be good. And so I know that this campaign has caused some questioning and some worries on the part of many leaders across the globe. I've talked with a number of them. Uh, but I want to, on behalf of myself and I think on behalf of a majority of the American people, say that, you know, our word is good. It's also important that we look at the entire global situation. There's no doubt that we have other problems with Iran, but personally, I'd rather deal with the other problems having put that lid on their nuclear program than still to be facing that. And Donald never tells you what he would do. Would he have started a war? Would he have bombed Iran? If he's going to criticize a deal that has been very successful in giving us access to Iranian facilities that we never had before, then he should tell us what his alternative would be. But it's like his plan to defeat ISIS. He says it's a secret plan, but the only secret is that he has no plan. So we need to be more precise in how we talk about these issues. People around the world follow our presidential campaigns so closely, trying to get hints about what we will do can they rely on us? Are we going to lead the world with strength and in accordance with our values? That's what I intend to do. I intend to be a leader of our country that people can count on, both here at home and around the world, uh, to make decisions that will further peace and prosperity, but also stand up to bullies, whether they're abroad or at home. We cannot let those who would try to destabilize the world, to interfere with American interests and security, to be given any opportunities is, at all. Is expired. Let's Mr. do Trump, one thing I'd like to say. Very quickly. Uh, I will seconds, go please. very quickly, but I will tell you that Hillary will tell you to go to her website and read all about how to defeat ISIS, which she could have defeated by never having it, you know, get going in the first place. Right now, it's getting tougher and tougher to defeat them because they're in more and more places, more and more states, more and more nations. Mr. Trump. And it's a big problem. And as far as Japan is concerned, I want to help all of our allies. But we are losing billions and billions of dollars. We cannot be the policemen of the world. We cannot protect countries all over the world just a, where they're not paying us what we need. We have and just a few final She doesn't questions say here. that because she's got no business ability. We need heart. We need a lot of things. But you have to have some basic ability. And sadly, she doesn't have that. All of the things that she's talking about could have been taken care of during the last 10 years, let's say, while she had great power. But they weren't taken care of. And if she ever wins this race, they won't be taken Mr. Trump, care of. Mr. Trump, this year, Secretary Clinton became the first woman nominated for president by a major party. Earlier this month, you said she doesn't have, quote, a presidential look. She's standing here right now. What did you mean by that? Uh, she doesn't have the look. She doesn't have the stamina. I said she doesn't have the stamina. And I don't believe she does have the stamina. To be president of this country, you need tremendous stamina. The quote was, you I have, just don't think wait, she has wait a Wait a minute, unless you ask me a question. Did you ask me a question? You have to be able to negotiate our trade deals. You have to be able to negotiate, that's right, with Japan, with Saudi Arabia. I mean, can you imagine we're defending Saudi Arabia and with all of the money they have, we're defending them and they're not paying? All you have to do is speak to them. Wait, you have so many different things you have to be able to do, and I don't believe that Hillary has the stamina. Let's let her respond. Well, as soon as he travels to 112 countries and negotiates a peace deal, a ceasefire, a release of dissidents, an opening of new uh, opportunities in nations around the world, or even spends 11 hours testifying 
in front of uh, a congressional committee. He can talk to me about stamina. The world, <laughs> let me tell you, let me tell you. Hillary has experience, but it's bad experience. We have made so many bad deals during the last... So she's got experience, that I agree, but it's bad, bad experience. Whether it's the Iran deal that you're so in love with, where we gave them $150 billion back, whether it's the Iran deal, whether it's uh, anything you can... Name, you almost can't name a good deal. I agree. She's got experience, but it's bad experience. And this country can't afford to have another four years of that kind of experience. We are at the... We are well, at the final what, question. One thing, one thing Very Lester, quickly, is, you know, he, he tried to switch from, from looks to stamina. But this is a man who has called women pigs, slobs, and dogs. And someone who has said pregnancy is an inconvenience to employers, who has said, said women don't deserve equal pay unless they do as good a job as Didn't men. And one of the worst things he said was about a woman in a beauty contest. He loves beauty contests, supporting them and hanging around them. And he called this woman Miss Piggy. Then he called her Miss Housekeeping because she was Latina. Donald, she has a name. Where did you find her? Her name Where is did Alicia you find this? Machado. Where did you find And it? she has become a U.S. citizen, and you can bet oh, really? she's going to vote okay. this November. Okay, good. Let me just tell you. Mr. Trump, just take you. 10 seconds and then you we're going to have the final question. Hillary is hitting me with tremendous commercials. Uh, some of it said in entertainment. Some of it said somebody who's been very vicious to me, Rosie O'Donnell. I said very tough things to her, and I think everybody would agree that she deserves it and nobody feels sorry for her. But you want to know the truth? I was going to say something Please, extremely rough to Hillary, to her family, and I said to myself, I can't do it. I just can't do it. It's inappropriate. It's not nice. But she spent hundreds of millions of dollars on negative ads on me, many of which are absolutely untrue. They're untrue and they're misrepresentations. And I will tell you this, Lester, it's not nice and I don't, I, I, I don't deserve that. But it's certainly not a nice thing that she's done. It's hundreds of millions of ads. And the only gratifying thing is I saw the polls come in today and with all of that money, we over $200 million dollars is spent, and I'm either winning or tied, one and I've you, spent practically nothing. One of you will not win this election. So my final question to you tonight, are you willing to accept the outcome as the will of the voters? Secretary Clinton? Well, I support our democracy. And uh, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Uh, but I uh, certainly uh, will support the outcome of this election. Uh, and I know Donald's trying very hard to plant doubts about it, but I hope the people out there understand this election's really up to you. It's not about us so much as it is about you and your families and the kind of country and future you want. So I sure hope you will get out and vote as though your future depended on it, because I think it does. Mr. Trump, very quickly, the same question. Will you accept the outcome as the will of the voters? I want to make America great again. We are a nation that is seriously troubled. We're losing our jobs. People are pouring in to our country. The other day, we were deporting 800 people. And perhaps they passed the wrong button, they pressed the wrong button, or perhaps, worse than that, it was corruption. But these people that we were going to deport for good reason ended up becoming citizens. Ended up becoming citizens. And it was 800, and now it turns out it might be 1,800, and they don't even know. Will you accept Look, the here's the, the story. I want to make America great again. I'm going to be able to do it. I don't believe Hillary will. The answer is, if she wins, I will absolutely support her. All right. Well, that is going to do it for us. That concludes our debate for this evening, a spirited one. We covered a lot of ground. Not everything, as I suspected we wouldn't. Uh, would The uh, next presidential debates are scheduled for October 9th at Washington University in St. Louis and October 19th at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. The conversation will continue. A reminder, the vice presidential debate is scheduled for October 4th at Longwood University in Farmville, Virginia. My thanks to Hillary Clinton and to Donald Trump and to Hofstra University for hosting us tonight. Good night, everyone.
concludes the first presidential debate, the first of three presidential debates uh, in New York tonight. You can see the candidates shaking hands with the moderator, Lester Holt. Uh, and I will we'll keep that picture up as we bring in tonight's power panel in Washington, Politico's Louisa Savage, in Toronto, Amanda Alvaro from Pomp and Circumstance. Here in studio, Tim Powers from Summa Strategies, Media Styles' Ian Capstick, and CBC Poll Analyst Eric Grenier. So I'm going to leave the pictures up because they are still compelling. Uh, and let's get some initial reaction. Amanda, how about you? What, what, what do you make of what you just saw for the past hour and a half? Well, I am, I am so riled up. I'm sure everybody on the panel is, too. And if you've been on social media, you know that it's been a frenzy, kind of like that debate. It was, you know, for something that was quoted as being the most unpredictable predictable debate that we've ever seen, it was utterly predictable. He was fly by the seat of his pants. He was, you know, throw those gross, vague generalizations. She was much more polished, focused, but maybe a little too canned, maybe a little too scripted. I know there were moments for me where I just wanted her to jump in and hammer him back, and instead she went with a softer, I hope those fact checkers are doing their job. I did think that she had some really powerful moments, particularly near the end of the debate, when she fought back on stamina, when she dealt with sexism straight on. I was really glad for those moments. But if I were to sum it up, I would say the debate for him was all about him. The debate for Trump was all about me. The debate for Clinton was all about you. Whether or not people took that away, it was certainly for me, it was about his resume versus her policies. Okay, and I'm still leaving those pictures up because you can see Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton now shaking hands from some of the people there. Uh, Ian, you were raising your eyes. Eyebrows, so your your thoughts initially, and then we can dig into some of the issues. Well, I, I, think we have time. Yeah. I think Rosie Amanda hit the nail right on the head. This was an incredibly predictable debate tonight. And if you could find two more unlovable American <laughs> candidates for the U.S. presidency, I would be shocked. These two particular individuals tonight played exactly to the type that we would have expected them to. I mean, almost goes without saying that Donald Trump was an absolute buffoon tonight, but I think that for the record, we should probably suggest that he was not just a buffoon tonight, but he was outwardly racist on several occasions and quite frankly um, he was wrong more times than any given fact checker could possibly count it's a good thing the entire American media core is on top of him and every single word that he said now at the flip side Hillary Clinton really didn't do herself that many mm -hmm. particular favors tonight she didn't particularly excel at some of the attacks that was clearly rehearsed and well practiced she does not have the charisma of some previous presidential debaters so all in all my heavens what a dreadfully horrific boy boring and disappointing comment on American democracy, to say the least. Tim, Tim, and then Louisa. Well, Donald would just say he expected to hear everything <laughs> Ian said, and he's, uh, he's cultivated the audience, at least the people he wants to talk to in the audience in that regard. What's fascinating for me, though, is we shouldn't dismiss this. Yeah. Trump has clearly calculated, for good or for bad, that his stick works, mm -hmm. and he's not mm -hmm. backing away from it at all. If, you know, use that overused phrase, he's clearly doubling down on it. You look at his linguistic patterns. They're simple, they're basic. It's us versus them. I'm with yep. you. These politicians are against you. You know, I've made lots of money, so you should hire me. Oh, by the way, I take pride in that I haven't paid taxes mm. and that I dodge the laws, and damn it, that's a good thing. To me, he reminds me of the barroom savant. And that's what he wants to be. <laughs> Barroom and Savant usually don't go together, but they do when you're talking about <laughs> Donald Trump. And that's what he's calculating uh, will work. On Clinton, um, you know, I don't think she necessarily was as, as bad as uh, Amanda was depicting. She could have been better. But coming out of this so far, I don't think anybody lost. And sometimes in a debate, yeah. That's the key thing. There will be a lot of traditionists who looked at this tonight and will say, God, that Donald Trump is terrible, but they're not going to vote for Donald Trump mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. What will be fascinating to see is what some of the, uh, you know, the focus groups and the polls that were done watching the body language and how that played out, uh, because mm -hmm. that was also sort of interesting. Trump was more reserved with his body language than he normally yep. tends to yep. be, uh, and that might have been a little bit of coaching. Okay, Louisa, then Eric. Well, I think on balance, um, Hillary Clinton really had Donald Trump on the defensive repeatedly. And if you took one thing away as a viewer from that first half hour, it was that he didn't pay his taxes. So I, I think <laughs> he really has had an opportunity here to learn a lot going into the next debates. However, I take a different view of this. I, I don't think that some of the, the 
misstatements that he makes or outrageous comments, I, I don't think they weigh against him as much mm -hmm. as they do rile people up on Twitter. And the reason is he is not about debating, you know, particular Absolutely. details. He is the candidate that's making a systemic critique. And he's saying mm -hmm. she is part of a system that is failing people, that is failing in the Middle East, that's got all these problems. And I'm against the system. And so in the first uh, opening bit of the debate, you really saw him going after trade deals and saying they're costing yeah. us jobs, the jobs are leaving. Now, you can fact check that and say, you know, actually the unemployment rate in Ohio is, you know, with the national average. But if you don't have a job or if, if you feel that your economic prospects are, aren't good, then you can relate to the sort of big systemic critique. And, and that's why I take him seriously. And that's why I think the polls have been mm -hmm. so tight, is we've had eight years of a Democratic administration. People are looking for change. And I don't think Hillary Clinton has quite articulated what change she represents or what vision she represents. She talks about a lot of specific policies, yes. mm -hmm. but he's good at giving that broad sweep. So I think he has enormous room for improvement and he's going to be mocked for all kinds of things. And there were moments where she managed to laugh at him. But overall, I don't think it was maybe as disastrous as it felt at times when he really lost his cool and went over the top because yeah. he was saying things that a lot of people yeah. can relate to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. Uh, let me just tell Jerry, I, I, I wouldn't mind you queuing up the, the ISIS clip if you can do that while I ask Eric. I think that is the question. It, did anyone gain any more voters from what happened tonight? Certainly, they didn't. probably didn't lose any, which I think is Louisa's point, right? Well, they probably didn't lose the people who are already voting for Donald Trump. Trump or Hillary Clinton. So it really comes down to that 5 to 10 percent who are undecided, that 10 percent who say they're going to vote for Gary Johnson, the Libertarian, Jill Stein, the Green. Those people, if they watch this debate, maybe they haven't seen too much of Trump beyond a few clips, the things they see uh, on the news every night. If they've been watching this whole debate for an hour and a half, are they still going to make the calculation that, no, we don't like Hillary Clinton, so we can maybe live with Donald Trump? Am I going to vote for Gary Johnson because I don't like either of these two candidates? Will they make that calculation and still say that Donald Trump is just as bad or just as good as Hillary Clinton? I'm not so certain that will be the case, but we'll have to wait and see. We probably won't have much of an indication of what impact this will have on the polls till later in the week and at least until next week until we really know there, there's, what impact will be. There's lots yeah, of clips. Because... There's lots of clips. Let me just play one because I think it speaks to what you're all saying when, when Trump was talking about fighting ISIS. I mean, I think it speaks to he's saying something but not really saying anything, right. and maybe that's of concern. So let, let's play that clip. Go to her website. She tells you how to fight ISIS on her website. I don't think General Douglas MacArthur would like that right, too the much. Next, the, next, the next segment, we're continuing well, the subject of Well, at least I have a plan to fight ISIS. Prosperity. No, no, you're telling the enemy everything you want to do. No, we're not. See, you're no, telling the not. enemy everything we you are, want to do. Folks, no wonder you've fighting. been fighting, no wonder you've been fighting ISIS folks. your entire adult life. <laughs> folks, well, that, that's me, a, that's, let, go to the, please, the fact checkers, get folks, to work. You are, so there, I mean, I think that raises a lot of points. One that Amanda made, one that Louisa made. It's a good yeah. example of sort of the dynamic there. Yeah, and I think the entire panel's agreeing here that what we're seeing here is a manifestation of the campaign thus far. This is exactly mm -hmm. the campaign that Trump has rolled out. And thus far, people like us sitting in these positions have sort of scoffed and said, oh, jeepers, it's not going to work. Until, of course, it does continue to work with the exact type of voter pools that we're talking about. And I think that that's the, the number one concern as we take a look at this particular debate. When you don't have a clear Hillary Clinton win, when really uh, Hillary Clinton walks away from this debate not losing voters but not really gaining as much as she could have otherwise potentially gained by knocking him down a few pegs. Mm -hmm. What we have on our hands here is a Donald Trump who is still um, gaining on the Democratic Party as it looks today from our vantage point, which again, as, as Eric has quite rightly said, people in our positions are not particularly great at judging these things well, right who now. Knows? Yeah, who and knows? it comes down to the media coverage of it as well, which again goes to how and what the power of Donald Trump's rhetoric is. There are only so many five to 10 second blocks you can fill on the nightly news. And he repeats his sentences, and, and Tim has quite rightly pointed to the sentence structure and how simple he keeps these things so that his message can be ultimately much better controlled than the Clinton message, which is far more articulate, but let's face you need 30, 45 seconds to understand some of what she's trying to say. Tim. If we were sitting covering any other debate and a politician in that debate said, I don't pay taxes and I, I'm smart, yeah. 
Uh, and I dodge and the I'm laws. And I'm not worried about nuclear weapons. <laughs> and I don't pay laws yeah. and uh, came up with that convoluted story about birthers. Or and, the 400 uh, fat pound uh, hacker sitting on the bed hacking that's the apparently, DNC. That's apparently Chris Christie. People Indeed. on Twitter have told me that. But, <laughs> but, but, look, but look, look at the context that he said it in. He said, you know, I don't pay taxes because I'm smart. And then later yeah. he went on to say it would have been squandered. And that's sort of part of this bigger anti-establishment mm -hmm. narrative. The, it's yes. the anti-establishment thing that's why he gets away with it um, I've been watching this thinking if you are uh, an educated wealthier voter um, in the suburbs who would have voted for Romney or did vote for Romney um, but mm -hmm. couldn't quite get on the Trump wa wagon or have been waiting to see did he say anything that put him now over the line beyond the pale unacceptable or if you're a, a hill republican did he do anything that was outrageous did he talk about the size of his genitalia i mean we didn't have that in this debate <laughs> we, we we had a few um over the top moments a few misstatements actually by both of them um but he didn't do anything that was so completely outrageous i think the the back and forth about uh, Obama's birth certificate. Yeah, he did. For was, some Republicans, Louisa, and him. here's here's what I think it is. For some Republicans, he went after Tim's free trade. Tim's next. Tim is right? next. I mean, and, and I'll and I'll toss right to Tim. But for some conservatives, he went after conservatism writ large today. So there are people like the previous presidents of the United States who are Republican who are very uncomfortable with him going after things like NAFTA and TPP because that's where their bread is buttered. Well, yeah, sure. but, he's been, he's been say, but he's been saying that for a long time. Okay, yeah, Tim's turn. Yeah. Tim's turn. Well, it's it's fascinating, Rick. Go back to the beginning of the debate and where. Clinton, I thought, was clever at the beginning. She tried to establish the frame. And she used two questions. What kind of country do you want? And who can shoulder responsibility? Mm -hmm. And though she was extremely detailed, as she often is in answering that, she stuck more to her particular narrative, I think. And she's going to want to try and leave that there. You saw her often talking about Trump trickle-down economics, trying to leave that in mm -hmm. people's minds. And then she went after the central narrative of Trump, which was also sort of wise, which is, I'm this great business guy, I'm a business guy, and you know what? I get stuff done. Yeah. And I think she's got to keep coming back at that, because the people who like mm -hmm. Trump, I think want to believe that what he's selling they can buy. Yeah. But if they suddenly discover that what he's been selling is a whole bag of goods and he's just like the anti-establishment people or he'd like the establishment people he's trying to unpack, he's going to have trouble. Okay, Amanda, then Eric. Well, I think the real challenge was that, that he opened the door and she just didn't shut him down. Yeah. He mm -hmm. opened the door on personal taxes, she just didn't shut him down. And the problem is that when you have 90 minutes and she provides articulate, thoughtful, considered answers, and he provides mm -hmm. sound bites, he really is the king of reality TV and the debate's a bit like reality TV. So what do we remember? We remember, remember that, that jobs are leaving, we remember that she had 30 years to fix it and she didn't, that she's a typical politician says stuff, but it doesn't work, mm. that we're going to take guns away from bad people. He knows how to create as outrageous and ludicrous as some of his statements are. He knows how to create memorable moments. She doesn't go for the clip. Okay. She goes for the thoughtful response. And does that stick with people? I got. I only got about eight minutes. So, uh, Eric, I, two, two things I think where, you know, everyone agrees that he has to pick up more African Americans. He tried mm. to make <laughs> pleas, but he talked about the stop and frisk, uh, mm -hmm. thinks, still thinks it's a great idea, and didn't do much around the whole birther story to help himself. So I don't know that, uh, I'll go to Eric and then Louisa, I don't know how you pick up African Americans when you're saying stuff like that. He's not going to. He's down 80 points among African Americans. That's Yikes. not going to increase yep. by telling them what the hell do you have to lose. To quote, yeah. <laughs> to quote Donald Trump. But I think one of the things we should wonder, uh, ask ourselves is why did Donald Trump make some gains in the polls lately? over the last month or so. There was the uh, Democratic Convention, but primarily it was because we were talking a lot about Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. about uh, foundation, emails, her health. Mm -hmm. It was a lot about Clinton, a lot less about Trump, who was being a bit more reserved. He wasn't making the kind of uh, gaffes that we had seen earlier on in the campaign. So my question is, is this a moment where we're still going to be talking about Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. or are people going to be talking a bit more about that whole segment on his tax returns, which I thought was a very strong segment? Yes. And then if a lot of people are starting to ask themselves, yeah, that's why is Trump not wanting to talk about that? Why does he not want to talk about uh, when he was uh, those discriminatory practices? If it goes back towards that, then maybe that momentum that he was gaining yeah, simply yeah. because people were focusing on Hillary Clinton starts to go away. Shift back. Louisa, then Ian. Well, I think that's right. And, and another area that Clinton is hoping they'll be talking about is his climate denial because she sees yeah. this as an opportunity to go after young people who haven't really rallied toward her. And the fact that he said he didn't 
uh, ever say that climate change was a hoax yeah. perpetrated by China. And you could see it in his Twitter feed that, that there was his tweet. Um, that, that gives the cable networks now something to chew on and talk about. So we'll be hearing that over and over again. Um, so mm -hmm. that helps her, not him. Um, certainly the stop and frisk, that really helps her because she's trying to motivate um, African-American voters and Latino voters to come out and vote for her, the so-called Obama coalition. So to the extent that, that he offends them, um, that helps her, of course. I just want to go back to one point about mm -hmm. trade because I think it's really important and I think it's important also for Canada. Uh, we just did a, a poll with, with Harvard University looking at attitudes about trade and it was quite remarkable, the reversal among rank and file Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, they are now much more critical and opposed to trade agreements uh, than Democrats. And that's really interesting and, and a flip. So this whole campaign and, and the Trump movement um, it may not be reflected in the opinions of um, members of Congress and senators on Capitol Hill, but it is uh, reflective of where the grassroots is now of the Republican Party. Well, and that really does start to demonstrate how complex the grassroots and the Republicans are in the United States right now, right? When we take a look at how many factions are, there are, really a lot of this comes down to can Donald Trump get some of these people to vote for him? What Hillary Clinton didn't go after tonight is what's really interesting to me. Ivanka Trump and his multiple marriages and the fact that he may not be the most Christian, shall we say, of Republican <laughs> candidates. They're really a strong super. Well, I'm just saying, it's not. And here's the interesting part is that he came so close to bringing yeah, he, up Jennifer Flowers tonight, of course. I didn't want and, to insult the family. I didn't want to insult the family. He came for so, not bringing it up. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he came yeah. so close, but just enough. So what kind of interests me is what do the next several debates bring? If yeah. this is where we kind mm -hmm. of came, this the is gloves, where we start. Yeah. The gloves yeah. almost came off tonight. Will yeah. they fully come off? And at that point, do we start turning off certain segment of segments of voters who perhaps hated Bill Clinton because of his adulterous ways, who um, see Donald Trump as being an absolute hypocrite. And that leads me to the debate about the audit, right? And I yeah, think that this point, this points to the incredibly astute um, analysis we're getting from DC today, which is that this is part of his systemic attack, that he's been under audit by the IRS for, uh, for 15 years. You, you heard him saying it. Other people aren't under that same audit. They're coming after me. And people do believe that. But what they don't believe is, why are you hurting those little guys, those people that Clinton could couldn't quite tee up the attack on that architect in the audience or the yeah. the miss the, the beauty pageant contestant who she didn't quite get there with that sort of pre-staged attack. She needs a lot more authenticity, that kind of how I dare I say it, that Donald Trump-esque authenticity. She, she smiled really, a few times though. <laughs> few. He's really good, even though he's wrong. Same with Amanda. Yep. Exactly. He's really good yeah. at the emotional pocketbook stuff. Just yeah. back on the yes. audit, right? Yes. All of us know yeah. you've been audited for 15 years. It's not generally because the government's after you, it's because you're <laughs> yeah. cooking the books in yeah. some way or another. They don't just decide to audit you for giggles. It's not, it's not random. It's yeah. not random. But Trump has turned it into his E and says, they're out to get me. Yeah. Well, by the way, I don't pay any taxes. Well, Donald, why the hell do you think they're auditing you? But that's a virtue. <laughs> the other thing he does is well is establish common enemies in simple terms. All oh, those damn Mexicans, yeah. they got all those great factories down there. You guys don't have them in Ohio and Pennsylvania. And guess what? I need you people in Pennsylvania to win. Look at those Taj Mahal factories. Yeah. And then the Chinese. I mean, he does it in such a simple way with such a simple prevailing logic yeah. that those people who are angry and are wanting to have their anger directed somewhere can have it more easily directed yeah. there than a three-minute deconstruction yeah. of Hillary Clinton's yeah. It makes them okay. an instant I gotta get, corporate I got about three minutes. I got about three minutes. Amanda, then Eric. Well, I remember somebody saying today, is this going to be a cultural moment, the kind of yeah. thing where people will yeah. remember for years <laughs> in the future where they were the moment that they watched this debate? Obviously, it was none of that. No. I would actually be surprised if in the next few days, if we saw the polls shift one way or another, and Eric would obviously have a better perspective on this than I would, I don't think that either of them loosened up votes in any way. Yeah. I do think this was kind of like the exhibition game before the big tournament, right? Mm. They learned mm. some things yeah. about each other. They, they're More importantly, their handlers, the people are going to help them with the next debate, learn some things about their opponents. Yeah. She needs a little more fire. He needs to hold back. Yeah, Eric. Well, there's the other factor that the media will play in this because a lot of people will gauge how the debate went based on how the media will frame it. And I know it's going pretty far from a U.S. presidential election, but there was a Quebec election a couple of years ago where uh, people uh, who didn't see a debate thought that the person that the media said won the debate actually won the debate. There was polls right. showing that yeah. that person they hadn't seen, they thought he had won the debate, and that party started making some gains in the polls. So. As much as all the audience is supposed to be very big, those people who didn't watch, who will just read the newspapers or watch the news tomorrow, their opinions might just be formed on how the media is going to frame it. I, I got like one minute. D just quickly, did anybody win? 
No. Well, I, I think on balance, Clinton did a better job. She had him on the defensive, and she gave a good, clean, short answer on the emails and moved yeah. on. She yeah. didn't get bogged down the way he did about whether it was the birth certificate or the tax returns or whatever. So as a debater, she was superior. Whether that really moves the polls, I don't know, but, but she'll come out of this feeling a new level of confidence, I think, going into the next one. And yeah. I think Trump's handlers will point out exactly where he needs to improve, and I would expect a much yeah. improved debater in the next round. Ten seconds. Anybody else? Anybody else? A Anybody draw. win? No? A draw? Okay. You know what we proved, though? We got stamina. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about Hillary, but we got it. You guys, I couldn't have had a better panel to guide us through this. Thank you all very much. Louisa Thank Savage you. in Washington, Men Averro in Toronto, Tim Powers, Ian Capstick, and Eric Grenier, all here with me in studio.